Hi, Chris. Hello, everyone. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank you. Ciao, Domenico. Ciao, ciao. Okay. We're going to wait two minutes to see if anybody else will connect to the, to the Zoom, and then we will start. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. I see John, Amy, Gaia, Tyler. Great. And I know that there's other people that sign up to participate to this meeting. So I would like to wait just for a few minutes. Perfect. Maybe can you check if there's someone on the waiting room? Yes, I'm letting in Fernando Iglesias and there's no one more in the waiting room. Okay, perfect. Hi, Aline. Nice to see you. Hello. <clears throat> Okay. Just to let you know, we were waiting just some minutes to see if someone else will connect. I remember that Bob wanted to present Andreas and there's one or two other persons that sent link and said that they wanted to discuss. Andreas, yeah. I know, is not joining. And perhaps we should start in the not too distant future so we don't waste the time of the people who are on, on time. So, uh, are you talking about Andrea Bergman or somebody uh, else? Bumel. Andreas Bumel. Yeah, he's, not, he's definitely not oh, coming. Oh, Bumel, Andreas, okay. Yeah, he and said... Bob is sick. I saw an email that Bob has been sick, so we might not see Bob. We Did might you say Bob? Bob? Yes. Okay. The flags. Okay. Yeah, he's 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 sick. I will send on the chat the folder that you probably you already have with all the um, here you have with all the files. Okay, it's eleven o five. So maybe we can start. Okay, I would like to establish some clear rules to ensure that the debate proceeds smoothly and orderly. I kindly request that you adhere to the following guidelines during the discussion. Each speaker will have a total of three minutes to present their initial viewpoints. 
and to, I kindly ask you to maintain a respectful and courteous tone at all times. I will open to a second round of um, discussion with no time, probably. I thought that we will have a little more people in the room. That's why I, I was thinking how to, how to establish some clear rules. But now that I can see that we are not that much, I think that we can be more relaxed. Okay, so um, I know that Chris, Domenico and Eileen have sent some documents. So maybe some of you want to start presenting and, and uh, sharing your views and perspective. I will invite you to, the floor is open, so I invite you to start. Who would like? All right, well, can I start? Of course, the floor is yours, right. Chris. Okay, I did have a um, PowerPoint, but three minutes doesn't give me much time. Um, I'm don't, not sure how much this has to do with world federalism directly, but um, I put together some ideas for a referendum to um, end the Ukraine crisis. So it's a possible basis for negotiations to end the war. And it basically consists of a UN supervised referendum in, of the residents in each of the disputed territories. Now, the war is reached something of a stalemate. Now, we'll have to see how the new Ukrainian, Ukrainian counter offensive works out. But, um, you know, it looks like both sides have um, dug in to some extent. Um, they have completely different objectives. Russia claims all of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Crimea. Ukraine has declared it um, will take back all those territories, including Crimea. Um, well, meanwhile, the destruction has been enormous. Um, whole cities have been destroyed. Um, Mariupol, Kherson, um, Bakhmut. Uh, the casualties and deaths on each side have been in the hundreds of thousands. And, um, you know, it looks like World War II all over again. And it's been estimated it will cost about a trillion dollars to um, fix all the damage in Ukraine. So um, we need, if possible, to, to prevent the conflict con continuing. And that's been argued by, for instance, Henry Kissinger, who said the conflict could escalate World War III. And Mark Milley, the joint, former Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman, who said estimated neither side could win. So is a diplomatic solution feasible? Well, a possible resolution would be a ceasefire followed by um, a legitimate UN supervised referendum in each of the disputed territories and um, asking, would the residents prefer to be citizens of U Russia or Ukraine? So the preliminaries would mean both sides withdraw their forces. The referendum would have to be supervised by UN peacekeeping forces. And um, the voter rolls would have to include all the voters that were resident in the territories before the Russian invasion. So that's the root of the idea. Um, there are enormous difficulties, and I don't know that I've got the time to discuss those. Um, but um, it would have the advantages that it would stop the enormous destruction going on in Ukraine. Um, both sides should agree, might agree. They're both very anxious to stop the conflict. Uh, provide they don't lose face. And they both claim the residents want to be residents of them. I mean, um, so if they refuse in, in some sense, they lose all credibility. Um, furthermore, the referendum would demonstrate the will of the people themselves. It would reinforce the principle of democracy. And um, it seems to me it would be the best outcome possible. Um, Crimea, for instance, might actually vote to stay with Russia. If not, 
why not let them? Um, I think the final thing I have to say is that, um, yes, there's been a similar proposal from Indonesia um, a week or so ago at the Shangri-La um, meeting, dialogue. Um, it didn't meet with general approval. In fact, it was bucketed from all sides. But um, yes, I, I think that's the most reasonable possible settlement. All right, I'll leave it there. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Domenico, would you like to present your main points? Okay. Three minutes. Okay. But, uh, my approach was uh, inspire, inspired by an article that uh, appeared on uh, Foreign Affairs brought by uh, uh, Kupchan and uh, uh, Richard Ass, <clears throat> on which uh, an article about which I, I, I disagree, uh, because I think that uh, a solution that uh, ended uh, the Korean War is not uh, viable for, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, the main point of my uh, peace, European peace plan for Ukraine <clears throat> are, uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, the interlocutors of uh, Russia must be uh, European Union mm, with uh, Ukraine, but uh, above all European Union because uh, uh, Ukraine uh, has uh, applied for uh, the adhesion to the European Union. Then I, I think that uh, it's important that the uh, European Union speak, uh, uh, European in itself speak with uh, uh, with uh, Russia. The second point of the uh, European plan concerns the, uh, the territories that are occupied uh, by Russia um, in, the last, in the last year, but uh, before. Uh, that, that is, uh, I refer to the uh, Crimea. Uh, I think that uh, why the uh, the Donbass uh, territories must be uh, give back uh, to uh, Ukraine. Uh, probably uh, Crimea uh, could be uh, uh, give, given to uh, Russia because uh, for uh, historical reason, uh, Crimea was not uh, a, a part of uh, uh, Ukraine territory. Uh, Crimea was uh, has been a gift of the uh, Soviet Soviet President Khrushchev to Ukraine in 1954. Then I think that probably is not a matter of discussion between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. But uh, the other territories must be returned to uh, to Ukraine, uh, especially uh, the Donbas. About the Donbas, the suggestion of the um, that, uh, of the paper that uh, I I wrote uh, um, take uh, uh, um, has been inspired by the uh, Italian experience uh, about uh, Alto Adige. Alto Adige for Italy, South uh, Tyrol for Austria. Uh, Alto Adige is a, uh, a um, small region uh, uh, whose population is, for the 70% is uh, German and 26% Italian and 4% Latin. Uh, Alto Adige has a very big uh, political autonomy, cultural uh, and uh, financial uh, autonomy. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, autonomy is uh, uh, supervised by uh, the uh, United Nations, uh, by Austria, and by the uh, European uh, Union. I think that the same, uh, the same hypothesis could be followed for, uh, for uh, the, uh, the, the Donbass. Um, that this is the, um, the, main, uh, the main steps of, the, of my uh, paper. Uh, during the second round, I will speak about my concern and my doubts about the, uh, the Chris uh, proposal, if uh, it is uh, possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Domenico. Aline, 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kamala, for bringing some of us together to explore some of the thoughts and ideas that we've been having on this. Um, for me, coming from a welfareist perspective, I think the primary focus on uh, conflicts like this is uh, international conflict resolution and international war. Uh, and here we have disputes over territory, in a sense, uh, territory and borders. Uh, and, and, that, and that is you know, including the Crimea region, uh, the Donbass region. Uh, under the sort of principles of international law, there are a number of aspects in terms of determining, you know, the territorial borders. One is historical agreements and practice. Another is the principle of self-determination. Um, but mostly it's what are the accepted territorial borders. Uh, and if there's any change in those, a process for changing those which is accepted under international law. Uh, here we have, in this instance, we have the territorial borders were even accepted, you know, by Russia. Uh, as you know, as uh, and, that, and that included Crimea as part of Ukraine, included the Donbas region as part of Ukraine. This was all accepted when Russia signed the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, uh, where they agreed to respect the territorial borders, uh, the accepted international territorial borders of what was Ukraine. So, in a sense, what Russia has done is violate not just the general principles. Uh, of uh, international law with regards to what are the territorial borders, but specifically the Budapest Memorandum, uh, which they signed. And those who don't know the Budapest Memorandum, uh, that was when Ukraine willingly gave up the nuclear weapons that it had on its territory, basically sent them back to Russia, um, and in return uh, got uh, the commitment uh, by not just Russia, but also uh, the United States uh, to respect the territorial borders that were accepted. So this, I think, brings me to sort of Chris's proposal. A referendum is not sufficient to change uh, territorial boundaries. It is an important part if a particular nation is moving towards independence, if it's been colonized, for example. Um, but just having a referendum mm. amongst a population within a nation uh, is not sufficient to be able to change the, the territorial nature of that, whether that became an independent nation or decide to become part of another nation. Uh, under international law, it requires a lot more. So how would we look at you know, using international law um, in this process? The International Court of Justice is the best body designed to do that. Um, in fact, many territorial disputes have been taken to the International Court of Justice. And there, there is, your, there is the, what the judges are looking at uh, is the full body of law that's applicable. As I said, the different principles, the principles of self-determination, historical agreements, what has been accepted, whether there's been any uh, acceptable legal uh, change uh, to those, and as acceptable legal change, that could be through a process that is supported by the Security Council, for example. Uh, these are all what the court would uh, consider. Um, and of course, you know, in this, it will consider the perspectives and views of the stakeholders they would have the opportunity to put forward their arguments to the court. So I think if we were looking for something like, you know, like a way of looking at these territorial disputes, the International Court of Justice would probably be the best place to go. Uh, and there are a couple of ways that could happen. Uh, one is that Ukraine and Russia could agree, you know, by mutual consent to take the case to the International Court of Justice. I'm not sure if they're going to do that. Uh, another way is that the General Assembly could actually request you know, an advisory opinion uh, from the International Court of Justice on a legal, uh, a legal status with regards to these territories. We've seen that happen before. Um, it's like uh, Namibia, Namibia for, for example, was originally Southwest Africa and that was taken to the court you know, um, through two, uh, two advisory opinions um, in the end that actually end up with, with Southwest Africa becoming independent. Uh, my expectation looking at the legal basis of this is that uh, if the International Court of Justice looked at this case, uh, they would not give any um, agreement to transfer of territory, Donbass region or Southwest, they would not accept that, that annexation. Uh, Crimea is, a, is quite a different story. Um, my guess is it probably still would not shift that, 
but there are some historical agreements, you know, with regards to Crimea that might come into play. But the key thing is, if a case like this was taken to the International Court of Justice, and we've seen this many times before, it actually gives a stimulus for the two parties to come together and come and get to an agreement uh, before the case actually finishes, and that's happened in many cases as well. So I would say let's look at better use of the International Court of Justice as one of the possible tools for resolving this conflict. Thank you. Thank you to you, Aline. Uh, so now the floor is open for John, Fernando, who would like to, Donna, who would like to jump? To jump in. John. Oh, I'd be interested to hear Domenico's response to Chris. So, uh, sorry, if I could throw one other topic on the table that I'd like to hear comments on from the speakers. It is, um, um, it, it is this, I, I have heard that uh, one of the problems, you know, that Russia drove Russia to do this was the breaking of our agreement not to expand NATO to, to uh, a neighboring country. And I, I'd like to understand what people think of that. I've, I've heard that sort of not in the mainstream media, but in, in uh, smaller media and I, I wonder, does does that fit in somewhere in either the, the International Court of Justice hearing or if there is a referendum, is there, I don't know, the, the whole issue about NATO and, and that's what drove this. I'd like to hear comments on too. Okay, great. I think that, uh, Domenico, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, about the um, the proposal of uh, of Chris, <clears throat> I understand the uh, the concern of uh, Chris and uh, above all that uh, uh, from a um, democratic point of view, uh, the referendum uh, seems being the best uh, uh, solution. But uh, I have to uh, a couple of, uh, of doubts. Uh, one um, more, more uh, theoretical and, uh, and the other uh, practical. Uh, it, it, it seems, if I, I understand correctly, uh, the, the proposal uh, of uh, um, Chris, um, his idea uh, is uh, uh, based on the idea of self-determination uh, of uh, peoples, uh, which uh, uh, takes it uh, for granted that on a given on a given territory, there are, uh, there are a population that, for ethnic, uh, religious, linguistic, or cultural reasons, constitutes a, an homogeneous population. This ideal uh, condition, I believe, doesn't exist in the, in the Donbass. Uh, this condition doesn't exist not only in Ukraine, but uh, also in the rest of, of Europe. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, in, in the Donbass, in the, Do in the Donbass region, uh, about, about two thirds of the population is ethnic Ukrainian, but 80% of the population speaks. Russian. Under this condition, uh, I wonder how can one expect uh, a referendum to solve all the problems of uh, coexistence with, between the citizens of the Donbas and above all relations between Ukraine and uh, and Russia. Uh, the second uh, the second remarks uh, that uh, this is an example, very practical example. Uh, uh, this example is, draw, is drawn from the European experience and concern events that uh, have been all over the newspapers in the, uh, the recent days. It concerns Kosovo, a political community that was formed in the basis, on the basis of the idea that uh, it was populated only by ethnic Albanians. And indeed, 90, 93% of population uh, are ethnic Albanians. Uh, but uh, reports uh, these days tell us that, however, there is a small Serbian minority, about 2% of this uh, of, uh, Kosovo, uh, Kosovo population, 
heavily concentrated in one part of Kosovo, which for various reasons still does not recognize itself in the Kosovan government. This minority has provoked uh, continuous, continuing uh, riots and, and uh, uh, as a result of which uh, NATO has been forced to reinforce its military presence. Such a situation is present uh, in most of the countries such as in the, of the Balkan region, especially, for example, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where Serbian, the Serbian part of the state is questioning the Dayton uh, Accords agreement. This is why, in, a, in my opinion, the idea of a referendum is a dangerous, could be a dangerous precedent for European political uh, stability. Thank you. Thank you, Domenico. Please. Um, well, okay, that, that's true. Um, there are all sorts of major difficulties. Um, the, you know, it would have to be mediated, maybe by Turkey, maybe by, by China, who knows. Um, the referendum would have to be supervised um, by large contingents of peacekeepers, mainly from, well, possibly from, say, Brazil or India, who are sort of somewhat neutral in this conflict. Um, Domenico is right. I mean, there's a diverse population there, but um, we have to do the best we can. What, what's, what um, better solution is there? That, that's what I ask. Um, I mean, Alliance talked about a, uh, if you like, a theoretical solution, a, a, um, reference to the International Criminal Court of Justice. Um, that would be fine in theory. The trouble is, you know, the two sides are at war. They've uh, thrown aside international rules. Um, they're fighting to the death at the moment. And the question is, what would induce them to stop fighting? Um, and I'm not sure reference to the International Court of Justice will do it. OK, I think I'll pause there. Uh, OK, uh... I see that, John, you have a question. I also see that René uh, Waterloo is here. He sent some documents for all of us. So I also encourage René and the others to participate and to ask questions. OK, thank you, Camilla. So I'd like to follow up what Chris said, essentially, with a question for Alan. So you talk about um, making use of the ICJ and the General Assembly can refer it to request an advisory opinion. And what is the impact of that if, if Russia and Ukraine are happily battling away? Does it have any impact on the competence or is it more to get the General Assembly unified behind a view? That's for Chris, right? No, it was for Alan. Can uh -huh. Alan just jump in and answer, the, answer that question and then otherwise I'll lose track of it. Alan, would you like to Yeah, so what, what we have with the International Court of Justice, which is a little bit different to either the Security Council or the General Assembly, is that the court takes a legal approach uh, to the question, not a political approach to the question. So if you have a look at the Security Council, you know, the countries vote according to their vested interests and those five countries that have veto power, if they decide they can veto something in the Security Council, as Russia has done with regards, you know, to their invasion of Ukraine, which means the Security Council being powerless to really do anything about uh, this, this armed conflict. Uh, the General Assembly uh, can take action on this, you know, as we've seen, they have taken action. Um, but again, it's a political vote that takes place, and the countries vote according to their political interests. So you see that those countries that have been opposed to the Russian invasion vote against it. Those who have got like particular relations uh, with Russia, uh, you know, like China and India, for example, have got big like energy and trade relations, and some of the African countries um, either uh, vote with Russia or abstain on this. So it's a very political approach to it. 
that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a role to play. And it's really good that the General Assembly has stepped in and take the role. But it's quite different to a legal approach. What happens in a legal approach in a court of law is you basically weigh things up from the facts and the law, the application of the law to the facts. Um, and in that, you can come out with a, uh, sometimes it's a much more nuanced uh, outcome, which is what we've seen in a, in a number of court cases over territorial disputes. And some of those territorial disputes did involve countries that were fighting. Uh, Chad and Libya, for example, had a lot of cross-border fights, not as big as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but over the Azov Strip, for example, which was like a resource-rich strip that they were both you know, claiming, and they had like lots of armed conflict over. What happened in the court then was they both were able to, to put forward like their historical claims and et cetera. Um, and then the court came out in that case, it came out in favor of Chad. Um, and Libby was able to accept it because it was not a political decision, but a legal decision. And they end up signing a, you know, a peace agreement with Chad and it's worked. On other cases, they can be a bit more nuanced. That, that may, for example, the Costa Rica and Nicaragua uh, conflict. And this is with the, um, the island in the um, San Juan River that, uh, Costa Rica claimed, Nicaragua claimed, and Nicaragua sent their army over. They took over the island, um, and this was partly to support dredging and other activities which they undertook. Um, what the court determined there was that uh, Costa Rica had sovereignty of the island, but Nicaragua had rights and were able to continue dredging as long as they did an environmental impact assessment. So it provided a basis for the two countries to agree. This is the thing that happens can happen in a court. There's a lot more time goes into it. That's why sometimes the cases take, you know, like three, four years, because they really explore the historical background. They really explore the rights of all those involved. And they come up with, in a sense, a legal determination, which I think is probably, you know, like the best representative of what the rights are there. Um, so that's where it's quite a different approach. And if the General Assembly, you know, like requested this, you know, it could provide the basis for a ceasefire with both sides saying, look, OK, we'll accept a ceasefire until we hear the decision of the court and then decide what to do after that. It gives a bit of breathing space. It gives a bit more time to explore alternatives. Um, so that would be sort of like a scenario that is plausible. You know. Going on to the referendum, I would say that a referendum in this context is impossible, uh, according to the criteria that Chris put forward. One. Uh, which Chris said, you'd have to have all the people who have been there before the Russian invasion, well, some of them been killed. So their votes being taken away, you know, by the Russian aggression. Uh, some of them have been deported over to Russia. Uh, others have escaped and have like, you know, had to find other places. Um, so not only is it going to be impossible to get the people, you know, who were originally there to vote, but even that vote would not be a proper vote because it's basically a vote at the point of a gun. You know, it's basically, we've invaded, you know, the country, you better vote and watch out because we've already shown that we can invade your country, which is, you know, it's basically uh, intimidation. Um, so I don't think you can actually get a genuine vote. Um, but that's even, as I said, even if you could get a genuine vote, which I think it's impossible in that situation, that doesn't constitute a legal process for transferring territory. If you allowed that, you know, Europe could break up into like 90 countries because of different ethnic populations in certain places deciding, hey, we'll have a referendum to claim independence. Uh, there has to be more to that because there is, as I said, a mix of legal processes which is required and referendum is only one part of that. You have to look at the other relations. And, you know, one of the key points, as Domenico said, is that we are quite mixed. You know, people have got different ancestries from different places and to try and base everything on separate homogeneous units is just a false reality. It's not what the reality of an, of the world is, particularly now that we're even more in, interdependent and have been, you know, we're mixed, we've been moving around, we're living in different places. Many of us are living in different places to where we're born. You know, we may be married with like people from different ethnicities or cultures. Um, so just basically 
focusing on that idea of a homogeneous unit as uh, providing a justification for independence or transfer of a territory to another country just doesn't really work. That's why legal process is so important because it takes in consideration all the aspects which are required in order to have territorial changes. Thank you, Eileen. Excellent point. Um, I see uh, Fernando and Rebecca. So, Fernando, please. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Well, let's see. I, I can't believe we are discussing about the ethnic and cultural uh, unity of countries at the World Face Movement. It was the receipt after the First World War, if I'm not wrong. Ein Reich, ein Land, ein Führer. So it's, that, it's incredible to me that we are discussing in these terms, how to rebuild the ethnic and cultural uh, unity of uh, territory. Wow. <laughs> well, in, in my opinion, as the world federalists, we are supposed to be in this conflict, we should just support international uh, law. And international law is very clear. After the fail of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has the second largest um, arsenal of atomic bombs. And they recited this according to a treaty to Russia in, in exchange of uh, protection and respect of their frontiers. And these are the frontiers, top that. All the rest is uh, what we can say about all of this, which is basically the conflict should be about territory, should be uh, solved at the International Court of Justice. That's our role as federalists, the support of international organizations in order to keep peace. And Putin should be is being judged by the International Criminal Court because the, he has committed crimes against crimes of war, maybe crimes against humanity. And this is the basic thing. In the meantime, we are supporting the country which is being in, invaded, which is Ukraine. And that's all. I can't believe we, we, we can uh, have any kind of role supporting one of the... And if you allow me, I don't like to much, uh, make comments about nationality and ethnicity because they, these are, of course, generalizations. But if you go to the, all the countries which are uh, close to Russia, from Finland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Baltic Repub Re Republic, et cetera, et cetera, and as for Russia, you will uh, find the tracks of history, which has been the Russian, the dream of the Russian Empire. And the dream of the Russian Empire was for the Tsars, was real for Stalin, and it's real for Putin. So uh, in this, this kind of things, my, my position is very is, is simple. And I have so legal respect of international law, and all the rest must be set by its international institution and support to the country and the people who are being in, invaded. But I wish to make a, a final reflection on this in terms of what does it mean for us, world federalists. Because we are set, according to me, to so th think about the end of the Second World War. At the beginning, there was an open space for uh, uh, in, uh, institutional reform. So the United Nations were created after the Second World War, and the European Union, the European community of carbon and steel, and et cetera, et cetera. There was a, a very important period in which at least we had these two big organizations, European Union and United Nations, which supported peace and war for many de de decades. Okay. But after that, we entered a new period, the, the period of the Cold War after the Korea War, and things changed dramatically. And I think we are facing a similar process. After the fail of the Berlin Wall, we, we have uh, a period of hopes uh, of the, about the unification of the war and a, a, a political land that was favorable to our ideas 
about the political unification through the federalist paradigm of uh, international politics. And then we had International Criminal Court and several advances also in, I don't know, commerce, world trade organization, and so on. But the period started to close since, at least since the Twin Towers uh, aggression, attack. And then we had, uh, after that, war uh, on Iraq. And then we had uh, uh, financial crisis in 2008. And then we had, and now we had this war. So this war, in my opinion, means that we are facing a similar scenario to the Cold War and the conflict between autocracies and democracies is clear. This was said by Joe Biden, but this is part of reality. Uh, and we should reflect about how can we support our ideas in this frame, because it's completely different to the frame we face it from 1989 to 2001. Power, political unification in the world, in a world which is divided into big blocks that little by little are getting more and more hostile to the others. So let's think about that. And I remember in those times, there were many proposals, proposals one of this was supported by Bertrand Russell about the idea of the, the unification of the world, global government, world government, global governance, whatever, uh, starting by democracies, starting by the countries which are uh, already democracies. And this was also the idea, not for the United Nations, but it was the idea for the European Union, which puts the the condition to be democratic to be part of. So let's think about if this is not the, the moment to, at least during this period, to think about if we can uh, move forward our principles through some kind, some kind of union of democracies uh, and uh, support this uh, idea. I don't think that- Fernando, I have four people on the queue, so- Okay, please I, I to don't... Invite. I don't think that the OTAN, the NATO is the, the, the right uh, tool, but maybe, I don't know, the OCTE or other organization, new organization. Think about this just to, to adapt our ideas to the uh, existing scenario. Thank you very much. Sorry for the extension. Thank you, Fernando. Rebecca, please. Rebecca, are you there? She's gone, I think. I think she's gone. So, Aileen, please. Okay, I've already spoken twice, so I'll keep brief, but I hadn't answered Donna's question. Um, but I'll just put it in the context first of the two reasons that Putin gave for invading uh, Ukraine. Uh, one was the threat from NATO, that they were threatening Russia, but the main one was the genocide uh, allegation. Uh, this is because the genocide allegation was the only one that could have had any sort of possible legal framework. Um, so the, the genocide allegation had actually started around about 2016, when Russia started um, alleging that Ukraine was conducting genocide against Russian nationals in the Donbass region. Uh, now, when there is such an allegation, that doesn't justify an invasion. Uh, that's quite clear under the Genocide Convention that if there's a dispute between parties arising under acts under the convention, like the Genocide Convention, this is the Genocide Convention, doesn't say anything about, you know, the, the threat of use of force. What it says is that one country can take the other one uh, to the International Court of Justice to test those allegations. One of the mistakes from Ukraine's side is that they didn't treat seriously enough the Russian allegations and so didn't lodge the case in court uh, and then Russia invaded, and now Ukraine has lodged the case in the court. It should have gone to the International Court of Justice back in 2016, and maybe that would have removed that 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 um, fabrication, you know, that Putin was giving for invading uh, Ukraine. The other one was that NATO was threatening Russia. Well, there's no evidence that any NATO country was intending to attack Russia. There was no military preparations uh, for attack of Russia. Uh, so this is also fabricated. But the reason why it's got some um, 
traction, I think, amongst progressives is because of what Donna says, is that yes, the number of NATO members has increased uh, since the end of the Cold War, and that's been included some of the former Soviet countries and some of the former Warsaw Pact countries. <clears throat> um, and that is not what mm, Gorbachev expected um, when he was involved in the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact. At that stage, there was some talk about making the OSCE the primary security body in Europe. So there is some credence to that, but one must see that why these countries decided to join NATO, and I'm living in one of at the moment, Czech Republic, um, and mostly it's because of the horror they had experienced, the human rights violations, the lack of democracy, you know, the um, you know, other suppression of human rights and civil rights in their countries when they're part of the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact um, and as, as protection. Um, and for, for many of them, that, they, that feeling is now justified because they joined NATO and didn't get attacked by Russia, but Ukraine, which wasn't a member of NATO, didn't get attacked. So one can see that it's not the US that was coming and trying to expand NATO. It was these countries wanting to join for their protection. So one thing as well Federalists I think we need to do is to strengthen the common security mechanisms like the OSCE and the United Nations so that countries don't feel that they need to join a military alliance like NATO. If those common security mechanisms are not strong, then countries will still feel the need, as we see Ukraine wants to join NATO now as well, because they feel that's the only way they can be protected. Thank you, Aline. Rebecca, you were on the line, so please. Thank you. I apologize. I had some technical bug um, and I couldn't come off mute, so I had to rejoin. Um, two very different observations on, on very different issues. Um, the first, uh, not wearing a, a CGS or even World Federalist hat, um, with regards to Kosovo, I think it's quite important to get the details right here as we consider the precedential value of Kosovo. So I'm speaking as somebody who's working in Kosovo on promulgation of the Constitution and with the Assembly at the time of the Declaration of Independence in 2008 and the ICJ advisory opinion on the legality of that declaration in 2010. Homogeneity was never, ever a consideration. And several sui, sui generis factors that do not currently relate to the Ukrainian situation were in determining that the unilateral declaration of independence did not violate international law as the ICJ ultimately did. And one of those was UN Security Resolution 1244, which as of 1999 had already placed Kosovo under um, the de facto um, administration of the United Nations mission in Kosovo. Thus, Serbian um, uh, sovereignty over the region had already been eroded to a significant degree. I also would like to remind that the constitution of Kosovo that resulted actually acknowledges the heterogeneity um, of Kosovo's populace. The very flag has six stars that represent the six ethnic groups like that or don't like that. Um, and one of them is for basically everybody else. There are five for the five main ones. Um, and of the 120 seats in the Assembly of Kosovo, 20 are reserved for different ethnic minorities, including 10 for the Serb population, which itself is not monolithic because the area to which Domenico referred, Michirica in the north, um, had long, and this is um, changing, has changed over recent years, had long refused the authority to recognize the jurisdiction of the Pristina government, whereas Serb enclaves, which are much smaller elsewhere in the country, um, had had to accept it um, as a de facto reality. So that's on Kosovo. Speaking now with a little bit more of a CGS perspective and as co-convener of the Washington Working Group for the ICC, one thing that we've seen from a federalist pr perspective coming out of the Ukraine situation, and it's very crass to, to say or consider this as a silver lining, is an appetite for international engagement in the United States domestically that we have not seen for a very, very long time. Um, Subsequent unanimous resolutions passed by both the House um, and Senate, among the only unanimous resolutions of our last, our current Congress, um, have called for international cooperation. Um, the Department of State is participating actively in talks for the hybrid tribunal as well as the special tribunal. And uh, to all of our great surprise who are watchers of the ICC, the so-called Dodd Amendment, which creates exceptions for cooperation with the International Criminal Court, um, was um, uh, adjusted in December of last year to allow for cooperation with the ICC in the, in the situation in Ukraine. 
Um, so these are enormous strides and we at the Washington Working Group for the ICC have concerns about selectivity of cases and the exceptionalism of seeing Ukraine as opposed to every other conflict that is ongoing in the world. But we are also trying to seize this moment and look at, look at it optimistically as the door being opened a little bit more um, at a moment where just a couple of years ago, I think we all remember the posture that the United States had towards international institutions generally and the ICC in particular. So sorry for being a little bit long-winded, but I think from a Federalist perspective, that is an important um, and maybe unforeseen outcome of the current crisis. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Chris, you were on the line. I just wanted to comment. I just wanted to comment. Um, <clears throat> Fernando and has supported a line saying that we should support international law and the International Court of Justice. Um, but he also says it's quite clear Russia is the one who's basically violated international law, um, and they're not going to submit to this without being forced. So if we follow the international law route, we need basically to um, follow the war to its conclusion. We need to defeat Russia. So that's one option. Um, what I'm proposing is a... Um, shortcut to end the conflict, end the destruction. But, I mean, there'll be nothing left of Ukraine if this goes on too long. Um, on the basis of a democratic um, referendum. Um, it, as, um, who was it? Somebody said it's enormous difficulties. Um, finding the people who were resident before the um, invasion, um, making sure they have a free vote. It should be an anonymous vote. So they, once they're ticked off the roll, um, nobody knows what their vote is till the, you know, an anonymous vote in the box um, goes in. So there's no question of being under the gun. Anyway, but it would all have to be supervised. It would be enormously difficult, but um, it might be a possibility like that. That's, uh, um, so there's two options fight to the end or try and find some resolution um, without halting the destruction. Domenico, please. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I, don't know, I don't know what uh, do you think, but uh, in my opinion, there is a, a military solution for the conflict uh, involving Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. Uh, the main problem, according to me, is the, um, the setting of uh, the, the two different problems. The setting of uh, Crimea on one side and uh, the Donbass uh, on the other side. Uh, if... Uh, in theory, uh, if uh, should the WFM take a position of this uh, uh, argument, uh, a position as a uh, as a compromise uh, between uh, um, the uh, Chris position and uh, my my uh, suggestion, that is, uh, we can uh, organize a uh, a referendum. Uh, both in uh, Donbass region and uh, Crimea uh, region, but uh, uh, these two regions uh, with uh, a different location. That is, uh, the solution is the same. That is, uh, the point of reference is the, uh, the statute of uh, Alto Adige uh, in the Italian case. But uh, Crimea uh, is a uh, is, uh, will be considered a, a Russian territory Donbass and uh, Ukrainian uh, territory. Both uh, with uh, a statute similar uh, of the uh, statute of uh, Alto Adige, the statute of, of Alto Adige we, we, uh, could be changed only after consultation with the United Nations, uh, European Union, Austria, and, uh, and Italy. Then in the case of uh, uh, Crimea, uh, the solution uh, could uh, should be uh, Crimea is a, a territory of uh, uh, of Russia, the same autonomy as for uh, Alto Adige, uh, 
Uh, but uh, the autonomy will be guaranteed by uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine, U uh, United Nations, and uh, European Union. The opposite for the Donbass region. Uh, the, uh, the, an autonomous status uh, as the Alto Adige, the territory of Donbass uh, will, uh, will be of a uh, Ukrainian territory. The, the autonomy of Donbass will be guaranteed by United Nations, United, uh, European Union, Russia, and Ukraine. Then this, this on on this on this proposal uh, could be um, a referendum could be uh, organized on under the supervision of the United no Nations. Um, colon. Okay. okay. Ukraine. I finish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see. I just saw that Hemachandra has sent a um, message from the chat, on the chat. Sorry, Hemachandra just seen this. He's saying the world has let Ukraine down by allowing situation for them to <laughs> kill themselves. Keith, um, Melina, can you mute Keith, please? Uh, allow for them to defend themselves by hiding them with huge stocks of weapons and personnel. How many of the citizens of the Ukraine have left their country? How many have died since the start of the invasion? Will we have had the situation NATO have also dissolved, dissolved along with the Warsaw Pact? The original problem started when the Russian ally was dismissed as the president. And what did the Europe not take action when Russia took over the crucial IPA? So this has on by Hema Chandra. Um, Hema Chandra, would you like to add something? Yeah, uh, what I think is, see, how did uh, Europe manage last winter for their oil and gas? You see, uh, uh, the feeling I get is these weapons are destroying people and livelihoods and countries. See what's happening in uh, Sudan. Today, it's happening in Sudan. And we can, the, maybe the media doesn't cover uh, as much attention as you get in Europe, the Ukraine problem. A lot of things are happening in uh, Syria. What happened in Libya? We don't get to know about a lot of these things. Very, uh, I mean, the media doesn't cover this. And so we forget about all these incidents. And uh, Syria, after so long, maybe 10 or 12 years, has been invited to the uh, Arab summit to this year, now, this month or last month. How can that happen? After all this, what is, whatever has happened between, whatever had happened within Syria. So I feel it is the weapons trade which is creating the problem worldwide, wherever you see. And irrespective of uh, laws which are there, the UN which is there or the EU which is there, by the time they, uh, what do you say, realize what the problem is and start to get involved, then they say there are laws, we have to follow the regulations and the rules, and nothing happens. People just die. I mean, it's impossible. When sometimes we get an, our Indian media, the kind of uh, the deaths people in Ukraine are facing, uh, the children, the old people, and even... Uh, abandoned animals by pets in the houses. See, we, we, we don't focus on all this. We are focusing mainly on military aid to them, the Ukrainians. How many Ukrainians have been trained to use weapons coming from Germany or the United States? They, they don't, they're not trained in those weapons. Somebody else is fighting that war in the Ukraine. And what is the end result? Every now and then they have a sort of um, uh, 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 s s possibility of exporting Ukrainian wheat out of the country. How does, how can that happen in a war, war zone? How can they make a deal like that? There's something wrong somewhere. If they're sustaining that uh, fight, they're allowing that situation to keep on escalating. There is no end to it. I think we as federalists should say, end, enough is enough. Stop it. Don't arm any either side. See, the, two of the speakers have mentioned that India and China are close to the Russians. 
India imports more than 70% of their weapons from Russia. And India also now, I think, is the largest importer of uh, Russian uh, oil for various reasons. And so uh, India also exports to Russia. So it's a dependency. I think somebody did mention that it all dip depends on what is mutually beneficial to somebody or the other. But there is no end to this. The, the military solution has to end. Only then we can have a peaceful solution. Thank you. Thank you, Hemachandra. Eileen, you are on the line. Sorry to take the floor again. I just want to respond to the notion that the impact of international court of justice cases requires like pretty much full or a lot of respect for international law from the big powers. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. We have a look, for example, at the nuclear test case. This was Australia and New Zealand took France to the International Court of Justice over the atmospheric testing of weapons in the, in the Pacific, 1974. France said, uh, we're not going to respect the court. But the very next year, they stopped their atmospheric testing case. Um, have a look at another case, Nicaragua versus the United States. Uh, this was over the United States providing military support for the Contras who were trying to overthrow the Nicaraguan government. Again, the United States said, uh, we're not going to listen to the International Court of Justice. But that what happened is in the United States, the decision from the court helped the Bolden Amendment, which made military support uh, for the Contras illegal. Uh, it, it, it made it much more difficult for the US administration to, to fund uh, and to provide military support. And it actually paved the way there for Oscar Arias to negotiate the Central American Peace Accords, which prevented the military support from both the Soviets and America uh, into the region. So the court can actually do a lot to have impact on the big powers, um, even if the big powers are like trying to, you know, not be bound by it, it impacts them incredibly. Thanks. Thank you, Aileen. I also see that we have Tail Masur, Martin Chivandra. I encourage, we. I would like to wrap up in, in 10 minutes because we already have done one hour discussion. So if anybody else that hasn't picked yet would like to do it, I encourage to do it. John. Uh, two brief comments. First one seems to be the where there is consensus is that world federalists could say that there should be a process, a legal process that's followed, things should be referred to the ICJ. That sort of statement could be accepted, it seems to me, by all world federalists. Um, I don't think there's going to be appetite for all world federalists to agree on a particular solution that should be implemented. And one of the points Alan made about referring to the ICJ is they can then go and do their research. And it might take four years to come to a, a decision as to what the best solution is. So we can probably agree that a legal process would be a good thing. And that's probably about where we will get to. Um, the other completely separate thing I wanted to say is to thank everyone for their participation. Thank you, Camilla, for arranging. I'm very conscious that there's quite a range of expertise on this call. And as one of the least uh, expert in this topic, I'd like to thank those with more expertise for their patience in talking to us. And I find it very educational and thank you very much. Thank you, John. Is there anybody else that would like to do a comment? I'm very curious and I see some new names, at least for me, uh, Gulnara Shahini. Martin Chivandra and Tyler Masur. I don't know from wh uh, which organization you are. So if you would like to present yourself, of course, the floor is open. And I also see that Keith Best has Connect also and Marjolin. So if you would like to jump, if not, we're going to wrap up. It's open. May, may I then uh, come in, Camilla? Thank you very much for, for that. I, I fear that I was not able to join all of you uh, at the very beginning. I'm actually in Georgia, having traveled through Armenia and learning much more about the extraordinary complex um, political situation here, um, where there is universal loathing of the Russians, not least because of two recent wars that were fought between Russia and Georgia, uh, the last one only as recently as 2008, um, there's still that continuing um, debate over the occupation of South Ossetia and Abkhazia as well, uh, and Armenia has an entirely different perspective as well, uh, now with no, of course, border 
with uh, Russia directly, uh, and Armenia is now seeking to get all its power from Iran. And in fact, there is a new pipeline being built there. So uh, I won't drone on about the situation there, but frankly, it makes the Balkans look like a very simple uh, situation. Uh, so this is re really very interesting for, for me. As far as Ukraine is concerned, I've been to Ukraine twice. Um, one, one, the last time was as a OSCE observer for the presidential elections, and I was based in Dnipro, right in, in, in the middle, and I still keep in contact with people from Dnipro. I think there is a fundamental principle here, and forgive me if this has already been articulated by colleagues uh, uh, earlier, that if there is any concession uh, given to the Russians over the uh, substitution of, of land for peace, uh, I fear it sends a very bad message indeed. Um, I accept that Russia has never under, uh, has never accepted uh, independence of Ukraine in 1991, or at least certainly not uh, Putin has not ne has never accepted it. And um, we should have read that uh, article he wrote um, over a year ago now. Um, with greater care, I think, to realize just how how strongly the Russians feel that this is still part of Mother Mother Russia. Um, but the fact is that Ukraine has been, and the whole integrity of Ukraine, including Crimea, has been accepted largely by the international community. Uh, and you know, just as Britain, when it lost an empire in the 1960s, didn't send gunboats in to try to reclaim it again. I do not think that any empire that may have lost part of its territory, such as uh, the Russian Federation, should try to regain that by force. And I think as world federalists, we must stand firm and say force is never the answer to any kind of dispute. Um, I, I endorse entirely Alan's point about the uh, ICJ. The trouble is, as, as everybody here knows, uh, the only way the IG, ICG, ICJ can adjudicate on matters is if there is mutual consent of the countries concerned. And the, the Russians are not going to agree to have the ICJ determine um, what the final boundaries of Ukraine should be, because they know that it's going to be in accordance with the majority of the global uh, state opinion uh, that Ukraine is a, a, a state on, on its own. So I fear that uh, although it is dangerous te territory, um, there has to be a military victory, but that will not be a sustainable victory for Ukraine. There has to then be a political settlement. And where I think the West missed a trick in 1989 and 91 in uh, offering a better hand of cooperation and understanding with Russia. Um, if there is a victory by Ukrainian forces backed by Western military uh, might uh, against the Russians, there should not be any kind of triumphalism uh, that in fact, uh, that what we need to do in the West is to say to Russia, we respect you as an international player uh, but we want you to play by the international rules. And so long as you do, you will be able to play a significant part in global decision making. Uh, and I think that that is the only way forward. But th th those negotiations have got to start now. They won't they won't be able to be done with Putin and they won't be able to be done with Shoigu or Gerasimov. Uh, they won't even be able to be done with Prigorsin. Uh, but there are people in Russia with whom those kind of negotiations can proceed uh, that actually show the West does not wish to humiliate Russia, that it does not wish to grind Russia's uh, nose into the dust, but actually wishes to work with Russia as a, uh, an active state player in future international um, uh, negotiations. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, for your comments and, and your perspective. I can see on the chat that um, Gulnara is saying that she's representing an Armenian NGO called Democracy Today, working on conflict resolution and democracy in the region. I also see another comment from Tyler. He's a law student from USA volunteering in Ukraine in a humanitarian capacity in March to April last year. 
And I see a message from John saying that Martin Chivandra is, was from youth who are uh, were federalist. Uh, so it's very nice to see you. Um, I think, well, we, we have to wrap up. Uh, it's a very complex situation. I think it was a very, an, an excellent uh, exchange of view of all of, us, all of us. I think that we should do this more often uh, in, uh, in the World Fairies Movement. We have to speak more between each other. So I encourage you to do this more. I'm the chair of the membership and outreach committee. If you have any, any idea, if you would like to organize any event to encourage these discussions, of course, we are open to do it and to help to organize. I think it's very, very important um, to share our knowledge and, and our different perspectives. So thank you very much to everyone. I hope to organize something like this very, very soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Camilla. Bye, 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 Chris. Bye Chris. Good night, Chris. <laughs> Bye, Bye. 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 Yes, good. <laughs> See you later. Okay. Thank you, Fernando. <laughs>